stoked for another episode of the Tracer Podcast. Today, I have on one of my favorite people in the hunting industry, Cody Rich. Cody, how you doing? What's up, buddy? How are you? I'm doing awesome, man. Just stoked to have you on here. It's it's cool having you on my podcast. A little intimidating. I think you've done like 6,000 of these and <laughs> I'm on episode like 24, but I do my best to not embarrass myself. Dude, I, I think you're doing awesome. I think it's cool. What's So far, what's the biggest takeaway from being a podcaster? Dude, uh, a, f- a few things. One, like learning to shut up. Like I listen to my podcast, which I know you, I don't think you listen to your podcast. Like I listen to them and to prove myself learning to shut up and let the the guest talk. And then also set up, like just getting like a proper setup, not rigging it and like having a good internet connection like, <laughs> is money. <laughs> if you could just do a solid, solid hour and not have like a bunch of dropped calls and that kind of stuff and delay, like it's just so much easier. It's like anything, right? Crap in, crap out. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Quality into it, it's good. Yeah, well, it's funny because we were um, talking about your new studio, which is super baller. And I was talking about when you're creating content, it's so nice to have it just set up. Like you have it dialed. It's so much easier. And I think like the podcast is the same way. Like you're just, you're dialed. Like everything's ready to go. You know how it works. And not to be so meta because we were going to talk about this in the podcast, but it's it's very, very similar to hunting, right? Like when you have a pretty dialed setup of your gear, like Mm -hmm. hunting becomes easier, right? It's like all of these things. I'm one of those people who like get stuff ready on Sunday. I want to know all my meetings, know all Mm -hmm. these things. And I feel like those people go into the week and Mondays are much easier because you're like, you just have thought about things a little bit easier or a little bit more. And so you go into the week and you're like, you're, you're, you're dialed. I'm just saying like, you're always completely dialed, but like you have this idea of what's going to happen. And like similar to the podcast, right? It's like when you go in and you're like, you have the good setup and you're not going to drop calls, you're not going to have all these issues. Like it just makes life so much easier. It makes it fun. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I came in here because we were actually doing product videos last night. So this whole podcast studio was tore apart so they can fil- film in here and do pictures. And I came in here last night until 10 o'clock and reset everything up for this. The camera was set up. The lights are to the right tone. Like it's all done. So I'm not in here messing with it because I'm having to plug things in because there's nothing worse than getting in here and there's not a battery in the camera or <laughs> it's just <laughs> getting it dialed. So yeah, I think preparation it's like anything, right? If it wasn't for illusion, nothing would get done. I say that all the time. And I was like, I'm a podcast. And I'm the kind of guy that just jumps in feet first and just goes for it or head first, I guess it'd be. And so I just jumped into it and just started doing a podcast. And then I haven't missed a week yet. It's been 24 weeks of podcasts and they're incrementally getting better and better. So it's just fun. It's like anything. It's I, I enjoy building things. I enjoy entrepreneurship. And this podcast, even though it's a part of Tricer, is still like entrepreneurial because I'm just learning a new aspect of the industry, learning a new, I'm getting relationships. I think that's the biggest takeaway for me too on it is it's not so much like putting the content out there to people, which is awesome. It's the relationships I'm getting with people I'm talking to, right? And they're coming on, I'm talking to them and we're having like a campfire, you know, even though we're you know, 2000 miles apart, we're having a campfire talk right now. And just, it's really neat going to do that and get to know people and throughout the industry. And it's pretty cool. I said this probably three or four years ago, and I think it's just taken longer to come to fruition than I thought it would. But I, I always saw a podcast as like, it's going to be tough to compete with the businesses that produce good podcasts because they don't have to have it monetized, right? And so like they can just mm-hmm. go out and produce these co- this content. And I think it's interesting to me, like I've always seen podcasts as a networking tool. It's like a way to meet the right people. I, I think there's ways to do it to be more popular. And there's a couple of ways to look at like any kind of content you're producing. And I know there's a lot of people who want to get into the industry. They want to do the YouTube thing, but the content you produce makes the connections, right? That's who you're going to meet. And the the interesting thing about podcasts is, especially an interview style podcast, you're going to have those interviews. You're going to meet those people. We're going to network with those people. And to me, that's always been the most valuable piece of a podcast. It's, I don't care if it really makes money. If it breaks even great, at the end of the day, if it grows the network, you meet people, you build those great relationships, the real value, right? That's Mm -hmm. how you move the needle. And this is true for any business. Like it doesn't have to be outdoor industry. It could be like in construction, right? It's all about your relationships and the people and those, those relationships create the next connection. They open the next door. And I think it's true in every business, no matter what industry you're in. Yeah. And I think for me too, like I have no idea what the monetary value of this podcast is for me right now, but the creative I get from sitting down and talking about hunting and keeping myself Mm. fresh and keep myself in it is really helpful for me in Tricer. And if that makes any sense, like going and creating new products and doing things, I'm just constantly in it now and and having this conversation with somebody every week. And it just helps me. I I enjoy it. Let's put it that way. Like I'm not doing this because I want to make money or because I want to 
like market tricer. I'm doing because I really enjoy this side of it. It's something that's outside of the business side of it with the stresses of business. I enjoy sitting down and doing this with people. So it's something I like to do and I, I'm, I'm having a good time. Yeah. You know, one of the, I don't know if like we can take this wherever you want, but one of the things that I always find interesting and you and I've had this conversation is like you have this whole other background, right? Like this whole other business and you started this as a side hustle. And now you're getting to that point where you're like, man, I could literally just go hunting all the time. And there's, there's value to that. Not just, Oh, I could go hunting. I go screw off. But mm -hmm. like the reality is on top of the podcast, like you could be out doing photo video, working with the product, doing all these things. And if you're seeing it, firsthand. I know it's just like from you and I chatting a lot, but it's like you're seeing firsthand, like, man, this is time consuming. Like I could spend all my time just doing this and going and doing cool things with cool people. To me, that's one of the biggest benefits of being in the industry, if you will. There's a lot of downsides for sure. And I think people put it on a pedestal, but at the end of the day, I think it's super cool to be able to go do fun trips, be able to go to Mexico with like people from friends and be able to call it a work trip. Like how crazy, how cool is that? Yeah, for sure. And, and I a lot of most of my creative juices come from the field, right? I, I think I spent like 50 days in the field this year. I spent a lot of time in the field. But if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have been able to like this new JC tripod and these new, we've, I have 15 new products coming out and that has to be field tested. Like it saves me so much money and time and headaches by me spending, I think I spent 30 or 40 days behind the JC this year, just proofing it and fixing things. And I made some changes that nobody will ever know. But we're so such so cataclysmic in making it a better product. Like it, it was, it was so worth being out there. And I can't get that from just building something in this office and never taking it out. I have to use it, and even letting other people use my stuff. It's it's good to get that feedback. But me actually being out there doing it is so important. You got to get out there and do it. Yeah, and uh, your brain's very different anyway. Like you think of these things. Like I could go out there and be like, oh. Yeah, it's good or it's not good. Like your brain is constantly tinkering. So it's very different. But I do think that like you being in that scenario, like being in the weeds is super important. And I think this is very true for any entrepreneur in any business, but it's like when you're in the weeds, the problem firsthand, right? Like you see it. And if you're building a business around anything you do, like it's important for you to understand it. And I look at so many businesses that big businesses that come out with products and they just don't really understand. Like they don't understand mm -hmm. the consumer side of it because they're not out there. They're not doing it. And, and man, you see it all the time, but that's why it's so important for you to, I wouldn't say you have to be the core customer, but at least understand it very well. And like, you're that, like you get to be out there, you get to see the problem. And then while you're tinkering with it, like eight hours a day, right? Like you're like, Oh, I can make this better. I can make this better. And it's, it gives you that time to think about it. Yeah. And, and I get to have things break on me. Like I want to break things. Like I was joking around my creative director was over here last night and he has all my products like in cellophane in their original packaging, doesn't open them, doesn't <laughs> use them. And I'm like, and he's like, I don't want to use yours all beat up. I'm like, we have such a different mindset, right? Like I want to <laughs> beat the snot out of this thing to the point that it breaks. I want to see what it can handle. And he wants to keep it as clean as possible, right? Because I want to be out there and doing that stuff. I want to beat it up and see where it's at. It is funny though. If you would have told me like three years ago, like I, I think influencers are like the biggest douchebags and then now I'm an influencer. Like, <laughs> <it's> like <laughs> my wife's, oh, you're a micro influencer. I'm like, what the heck? Like, where did this come from where I'm having to get content, having to be like the face of this thing on Instagram? And it's fun though. I really enjoy it. Um, but man, I never would have thought that I would be like, constantly having to get content and do that stuff, but it is part of it, man. And, and getting that content in the field is important and it's a whole other side of it. So you have to be out there like, yeah, I could go hunting pretty much year round now if I wanted to. I don't because I'd run another company, but it's important. And it's not like you're out there just hunting. You're out there actually building your company and learning and developing products, right? I, I can't develop these products without using them. This is my opinion. Like, I, Yeah, for sure. And the, so the other day I had this like thought and I'm going to try to elaborate on it here, but I'm still fleshing it out. Like we always talk about the, the parallels between like entrepreneurship and hunting and not everyone's an entrepreneur, but maybe like you'll appreciate the hunting side of this. If not, there's a ton of people out there in the world that are like, yeah, someday I want to go elk hunting. And they put this on a pedestal. And I, I talk to a lot of these people who they want to go elk hunting someday or like someday. And they, they put, always put out, I want to do it. If I draw this tag, they always want like the premier tag and entrepreneurship mm -hmm. is the same way. Like everyone a lot of people message me or send me DMs like, hey, what about this business idea? Is it good or not? And to me, it's it's very similar to not going elk hunting until you have a Nevada tag or an Arizona tag. And so even if you got that tag, 
you wouldn't have the skills to to bring it to fruition, right? Like you wouldn't be able to do it justice. And so I look at both entrepreneurship and hunting as you just have to go do, you have to like, you have to do the thing and you have to learn the skills through failure. You have to keep twisting and pivoting. Like you're never going to go out and the first time you're ever going to hunting and kill a 400 inch bull. And if you do, it's pure luck, but it's, you don't have the skills yet. You have to go fail a whole bunch. You have to figure it out. And I look at entrepreneurship as the same way. And I think you fall into this category of you're just willing to fail first. It's like starting the podcast, right? You knew it wasn't going to be good, but you knew <laughs> that it was going to get percentage points better every time you did a podcast. And you have to like, I think it's the same as hunting. You're like, you don't expect to go kill a 400 inch bull on your first day of hunting, or you're not going to go. That's just silly, right? Like it's unrealistic. And so you're like, I'm going to just keep getting better, keep figuring it out. I'm going to keep learning. I'm going to keep listening to podcasts, watching YouTube videos, and I'm going to keep going and I'm going to develop the skills over time. And I think it's easy to look at hunting as like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little bit better every year. I'm figuring this out. I'm figuring elk out. And eventually I'm going to kill one. I think there's, I would say the majority of elk hunters are like still figuring it out. They've maybe had some success, but they don't think they have to be killing an elk every time they go hunting. But yet people put that same framework onto entrepreneurship. And like, I'm only going to do it if it's going to be a home run. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You've read the E-Myth Revisited, right? e -Myth? Yeah. I'm reading, I just finished it again today. I, mean, I don't know. I've probably read that book like four or five times. And it talks about almost a similar thing. When you, when you email me this, oh, I had this thought very similar. Like I want to start a business. He's going to start a business. But if you were to start that business and you were to put the structure in place first and think about it. For, so it's like drawing up that bull tech, right? So there's a correlation there where if you were to put it in place, like we're starting a business, okay, I'm going to start a business, but I'm going to need this structure. I'm going to need to have an account. I'm going to need to have a salesman. I'm going to need to have all this stuff and build the whole business plan first. You're going to be a lot more successful with that business. Where with that same thing with that, that strip tag for mule deer or that unit one tag in Arizona, if you wait 20 years to go elk hunting, just because you're going to this, going to unit one doesn't mean you're going to kill a 400 inch bull. Right, you need to put the the stuff in place before you get there, so you can kill that four hundred inch bull. Because things just slow down. Uh, I, I thought I had Robert Clark on. You're, you're friends with Robert, and we talked about that. How things just the more time you spend in the field, hunting just slows down for you, and it gets simpler and easier. It's not as complex. You're not as worried, not as stressed out. You just figure it out. You learn the animals. You learn what they're doing. And you're a lot more successful versus just waiting. And, and there's so many guys who do it. I have a lot of friends who have fifteen to twenty points plus and they haven't had an elk in 10 years and it's just like good luck and if you get a guide yeah if you get a guide you're gonna i'm all about it you know but i would much rather i'm of the mindset that i would much rather draw tags that are not as premier and get out there and get that field time and maybe get lucky and get a big bowl than just wait 10 years and not have that training because you can't replace that training like there's just no way to get it other than to get out there and hunt yeah. And I think in both cases, like both hunting, entrepreneurship, hell, you could wrap in life to this conversation. But for me, it's always, you have to ask yourself, who do you want to be in the end, right? Do you just want to kill big, do you just want to have a trophy on your wall or do you want to be a good elk hunter? And like, for me, I've always like, I wouldn't say I've struggled with it, but it's, yeah, man, I really want to kill big bulls and I love chasing big bulls, but it turns out that's hard and <laughs> I'm not always successful at it. But at the end of the day, is my goal to have a wall full of trophies I can brag about? No, it, my, my goal is to be a really good elk hunter. And so I have to just take those failures and it, could I go just lease up some property and kill giants and show the internet, look how great of a bull hunter I am. I'm like, yeah, maybe I could, but like it it's, defeats the point of like, you have to ask yourself, who do you want to be? And there's a price that gets paid for all of those things. So if you want to be a great entrepreneur, you want to be a great business person, you, hey, hell, you want to be a great dad, or you want to be a great hunter, like all of these things have a price to pay and it's, it's repetitions, right? Like you have to just go through the repetitions of doing it all the time. And then that's how you get better. And so I look at like the failures per se. I went to Arizona and struck out this year and that was a real tough pill to swallow because I spent a bunch of points on it. But like at the end of the day, can I like pull the good out of it and be like, oh man, if I ever did that again, like I'd be a lot better for sure. And overall, did it make me a better elk hunter by going and trying to figure out that stupid desert? A, I learned I hate cactus, but B, I think <laughs> on a grander scale, like you become a better hunter, right? And so you just be like, all right, you got to pay your dues. You got to put in your time. And, and that's to me, I always, I keep falling back to, okay, who do you want to be in the end? Do you want to just have a wall full of trophies or do you want to be a great hunter? Yeah, and I think the willingness to fail too, like you said, and get out there, 
if you do it enough, eventually you're going to get that big bull. Mm-hmm. Right? Like same thing with business. If you try hard enough and you commit to it, eventually you're going to get the product you want to get to. Now there should be some planning going into it. Like you shouldn't just go out there and just start throwing products and no. wasting money. The same way you shouldn't just go draw an Arizona tag and just go walking around with a rifle and <laughs> just hope one stands up, right? There's going to be some strategy involved in that, but you have to be willing to go out there and do it and fail. Like you said, And you have to be willing to learn from that and learn from your failures. And I think one of the, we call them expensive lessons, right? (laughs) Me and my friends, especially at Tricer, my partners, like we've had some very expensive lessons with marketing, with all kinds of stuff where it's cost us thousands of dollars, but we're not angry about it. We would never do it again, but we learn from it, right? Like you have to learn from those expensive lessons. That was, not only was that an expensive tag for you, you had to drive, what, 2,000 miles to get down here? Right, yeah. you had time yeah. away from your family. You were down gone for two weeks. You're gone during Thanksgiving, I believe. Or yeah. you come after? I can't remember. No, uh, it, yeah, it ended up going afterwards, but also cost me a set, whole set of tires. <laughs> it it brings me to like inputs equal outputs, and I say this both in elk hunting and in business. And I think once you, I did an entire like solo podcast. I don't even remember where it was, but I did this talking about inputs equal outputs, and I, I heard it from the business perspective, but it's so very true in the hunting. But I I think I've learned another lesson on top of that. So I'll give you the first one and then I'll add to it. So the first is we all know that inputs equal outputs. If I do X, I get Y. Like I do do this, I get that. And I think it's very true in elk hunting, right? If I know that if I, let's just use locate bugle, say I'm an area, right? I locate bugle enough times, enough of those, like I'm going to get an answer. And out of those answers, if I get enough answers, I'm going to find a bull that wants to play. It's just a numbers game. So Mm -hmm. I know that if I cover enough ground in enough good places, I'm going to get an opportunity. But I think, and that's like the inputs equal outputs. And I think that's very true. I look at hunting in that way of, I just have to cover enough good ground and I'm going to get that opportunity. The difference is that not all inputs are the same. You have to have context for knowing if something works, right? So let's just say you have zero experience in marketing, right? And you're like, oh, I read this in a book or I saw this, I'm going to do this. And then you waste money, right? And you're like, oh, bad idea. Now you have context. So then you go to the next thing and you're like, oh, this, but this, and you keep going down this like context rabbit hole of what are good inputs and what aren't. So for example, from a hunting perspective, say, and I use elk all the time because that's like my favorite thing, but let's just say like I had no experience whatsoever in elk hunting and I go out and I'm like, man, I don't know if this is an elky area or not. Like that, I don't have enough context. And so what a lot of the repetitions are just building this context. You're building that, that memory bank of, oh, this is good. or I like this situation or this is elky. I need to stay here. And that's what people I don't want to say fail to realize is that it just takes a lot of those inputs being in the right place at the right time. Like it takes looking at a lot of country, take coos deer, for example, I don't have any experience. And if I went down there, I'd be like, I don't know if this is good or not, but the more mm-hmm. years you put in at looking at coos deer, looking for coos deer, you're like, I got this gut feeling. That gut feeling is your intuition. Like you've seen this enough times that this is good or not. You have context is that enough of those good setups, those good glassing points are going to equal you finding it. And so that's how like I, I think about it a lot, both in business and in hunting is like inputs equal outputs, but you have to build up enough repetition to gain the context for what is a good input and what's not. How much, like speaking on that, I think it's a good correlation for hunting and business. How much of failure is from people just getting their head stuck in the sand? I'm going to go here because it looks really good and staying here. That makes sense. Okay. I I saw an elk here. My grandpa killed an elk here. So I'm going to go right here. So I'm going to do it. And the same thing with business. Like you get your mindset on, I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do and not being willing to pivot. How important is that pivoting and that moving to that, go to the next spot? And you see this a lot with hunting, especially with people who have had success in a certain area. Like we all know, like the classic example of, oh, grandpa hunted here. So I hunted here. And you're like, People will say, I see this all the time. I was like, hunting is not the same as it used to be. You're like, yeah, in that spot. And you have to grow out of that. And I think it's easy to get stuck in these, here's what's worked. And I think as humans, we tend to gravitate to, to what's worked for us in the past, which is not always the case for the future. And so once you break out of that shell, it's easier to recognize. So mm-hmm. for me going to Arizona, like I, d- I just don't have any context of what was good the year before. And so for me, I'm constantly bouncing. And in a way, maybe in a bad way, like, I'm not putting enough effort into it. And it's a balance, right? Like 
I also see people bounce around too much. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not giving it enough. This, <laughs> I love how there's so many parallels between business. It's maybe you ran uh, a few Facebook ads. Like, oh, Facebook ads suck. They don't work. <laughs> it's like, yeah. like, you ran it for a week. Do you really? Is that a- the answer? And same with hunting. Like I could walk down in Ar- Arizona is a great example because like you could sit there for days and not see anything, but it's a great area. And so you could go glass for an evening, not see anything. Is there any elk there? Maybe not. I don't know. And so like you have to give something enough effort and that depends on the area. And that's the hard part, but I do see both sides of this. So there's not, there's, it's not black and white. There are people who will go and hunt the same place over and say the hunting's not what it used to be, but they're, they don't want to branch out and find new areas. And in the same vein, like they, there are people on the other end of the spectrum that just bounce around and they're like going too many places, not putting enough effort into it. So Again, I think it boils down to like your context, like how much experience do you have looking at those bucky or bully areas? Oh, this looks bucky. How do you know that? Do you have a bunch of experience? When I went to Arizona, nothing looked bully or bucky to me because I'm like, (laughs) this doesn't make sense at all. But that's just because I didn't have years of experience looking at that type of terrain. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a little bit of both. No, I think it does for sure. And I think it, for me, it's the same thing, right? If I know there's like an animal, if I know there's elk in an area, like even though I might not see them, I, if I get, I know that if I continue to hunt the area long enough, I'm eventually going to get a chance at this elk. I had this mm. situation with my kids hunt. Like it was, I knew there was elk in this area. He ended up missing opening day, but and a few times we moved because we were just like, we just don't want to hike down there. We're tired. But it, that never panned out for us as moving. There's been other times where I've hunted an area and for four days and not seen an elk and then made a move and killed a bull. Because sometimes it's important to move. I think the same thing for business too. When you're when you have a business, you're the only one that's going to believe in that product. You're the only one that's going to believe in what you're doing. And other guys might say it's cool, but you're going to have to stick it out sometimes. And you have a good product. You know the bull's there. But you're going to have, even though people think you're crazy, you got to stick it out and keep doing it and keep fighting and fighting and fighting because eventually it's going to take off. Because you know, you believe in it and it's your vision and your dream. You're going to get there. But at the same time, like for me, I've had products that I've done where I put a lot of passion into and I thought they were great and people didn't think they were great. So I had to be willing to pivot and make so something when, else. How do you know when to fold them? Dude, I, I think I've gotten, you have to have thick skin. Like you have to have thick skin and just recognize if it's not selling, it's not a good product. <laughs> like <laughs> if it's not, that's I, that, if it's the best barometer for business, right? If it's not, If it's not selling, it's not a good product. If there's not elk, it's not a good spot. If it's just like the, the proof's in the pudding. I think if with me, if I have a product where I have to just constantly be training people to use it and I'm constantly having issues with it, it's just like, it's probably a thing I need to fold on and go on. Like, <laughs> right. I thought it was great, but it's maybe it's not. If I have to constantly tell people why it's great, it, it's not worth it. But if people tell me it's great and it sells itself, then it's a great product, right? And right. It's the same thing for hunting. If I have to like tell myself like, oh, my grandpa killed one here 20 years ago, but I haven't seen one. It's, I shouldn't be there doing it. I got to move on and be willing to fold them and go find a new spot. And yeah. you know, it's successful. I heard a quote the other day that was, oh shoot, how did it go? It says, if you have to do sales, it's because you're bad at marketing. And if you have to do marketing, it's because you're bad at product. And I think <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that. A great product sells itself, right? 100%. Like a, gr- a great area in hunting. So, yeah, like, you, it's not a question, right? <laughs> And like yeah. everyone has their own, like what they're looking for. But I think going back to the product thing is if you, again, if you have to sell people on it and they're just not buying it, maybe it doesn't matter. Like maybe it's on to the next thing. And I think we can look at like all the things that we want and be like, man, this would be so cool. But at the end of the day, does the market want it? And maybe there's a lot of products I think that just come too early. And maybe that's a piece of it. Maybe it's timing. And I think that's a, a timing is a good way to not, to have thick skin, but like to avoid it. So it's not your fault. They'd be like, this product was just too early. And and a lot of times it's, you can sit here and try to tell people about the product. And sometimes they'll be like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. But the litmus test is if they take their wallet out, do they actually Mm -hmm. buy it? And people can tell you like, oh, that's such a great idea. But at the end of the day, if they don't pay for it, like there's your answer. And I think you've seen this because you've had products that are rocket ships, right? When something is like, oh, I get it now. This is what it looks like when people Mm -hmm. want your thing, when it's a great product. And I think you have to just be able to kill your babies until you find that thing, right? You have to just say, okay, (laughs) until I find that rocket ship, like this one's done on to the next one. Yeah. I'm a very like change oriented person. Like change doesn't scare me. I love change. 
But change is one of the scariest things for, I would say, 95% of people, right? Like I love change. I love new systems. I love figuring things out. So I'm not a, I'm, I'm a guy that's not afraid to bounce and change things up and figure it out too as well. And I think you can't be afraid of change, right? With products and with business, like you can't be afraid of that's not working. Let's not throw good money as a bad product. Let's just kill the bad product and continue to go. Oh, and products are good, by the way. But <laughs> you guys just don't know what you're talking about. If you don't like it, it's your fault. Right? That's the mindset you have to be careful for because it's like you put when you put time into something, it could hurt when people don't like something. And you're like, yeah. no, you're wrong. And it's like the consumer's never wrong. At the end of the day, right? <laughs> how do, how do you not take it personally? Oh, I take it personally. No, I I've gotten like, how really do you get good. over it? Uh, I text you what I was going to say to the person. All the time. It's so like today I text you, right? Like yeah. this is like this is me being really nice. Like I sometimes I just can't help myself and I'll just come at somebody. But I think dude, because dude, th- these keyboard warriors are they're hard. It's hard because I don't think people understand like when I'm creating all these products, I'm putting my heart and soul into them. Like you get it, right? You see me coming yeah. at you and like we, we talk together a lot. And like I'm putting my heart into it. So when you come out and just bash it or say something or do a review video that's like way off or a hit piece. It's very hard not to take it personal. Yeah. It's very hard for me to walk away from it. Like where my partners just laugh, like, oh, that's funny. And I'm just like, how are you not? It's like you're like, someone telling you your kid sucked at baseball. Like you, you can't <laughs> not take it personally. That's right. your kid. You put all that time into it, you made it. And it's just, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's hard not to take it personally. It's hard to not, I think you have to look at all the good things people say as well. And, and try and brush us under the rug. But yeah, it's I, I have a hard time separating the two. A very hard time. And I always will. But I think that's good though. I think you have to take it personally because it's motivating. Right. Like you have to see things like when someone comes at it or or if there's an issue with my products like breaking, like I want to figure out how to fix that. I don't want to just keep selling a product that's going to break. I want to find a way to fix that and make it even better, right? Or if there's an issue with, um, I mean, the, the LP pan head is probably like the hottest selling pan head in hunting industry right now. And I've made like four changes to that this year that no one's even known about to make it even better. Right. And my, why are you doing that? Because I can make it better. Like I, I see something and I'm like, Oh, that's a good idea. Let's change it. Let's do it. And I'm always evolving and you can't get just stuck on. This is my kid. He's the best. But it's the same thing with someone called my kids going to Africa. Right. I'll hopefully just listen to this. He's going to Africa with my wife. I went to Africa with them last year. My 15 year old's awesome. He does youth ministries at the church. He does, he works hard. He's a good kid. He went to Africa last year. I was going to send him by himself to Africa with my buddy, Jeremy. And Jeremy called him like, hey man, I talked to Rihanna. We're good with him coming, but I want you to know that like he was like, talk back to Rihanna at the church event or the Christmas event where he was setting up and he's going to be a smart aleck. And like you, your kid, when he goes, I need to be able to slap him in the head. And so many parents would hear that and be like, F you, man, my kid's awesome, right? Or call that you're holding a PTA meeting to get him kicked <laughs> out of the church because he's a bad pastor, right? Or this right. teacher sucks. You have to take that criticism. And, and, and so I went and told my kid like, hey, man, this is what's happening. Like, you're going to go, but you have to, this is, let's grow, let's learn from this experience and grow from it. So I don't know. I hope that makes me, makes sort of sense. No, it does. And I was going to say, I remember when I first started my podcast and like you're, I was pushing for reviews and like always asking for reviews and I could get a thousand good reviews and then someone <laughs> would leave a bad one. And you're like, just ruins your day, dude. Like yeah. it was so hard. And I, I like, this is someone else's advice. It's not my advice, but I'll give it to you. And I think it's decent advice. And it's what it's the, the stoic advice is to acknowledge and then one up. And so you're like, to take, to take, let's say, negative review on a tricer or something like that. It, this may be a little bit different because this is in the context. The, the original context was in like a YouTube comments or whatever, but is to acknowledge and one up it and be like, yeah, I am a total idiot like that. And in some mm-hmm. ways, like you acknowledge their stance or whatever, it, but you don't let it crush you. And in some ways, I do feel like it helps. You're like, yep, I'm an idiot. And you just move on. And I think there is something to be said. Again, the reps of getting these punched in the face, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. It does It does take a few to just get through it, right? But you have to have, I like your mindset of, I have to be able to learn from it and grow from it. And so like, how do we make that product better? And maybe like the poor reviews or whatever, hey, I like your feedback. Here's what I want to change. Mm-hmm. And then you're acknowledging it. 
I also think it's really important, and this maybe this is only for you. There's probably not a ton of people listening to this that have the same uh, use case. But in a lot of ways, I look at comments as everyone else is watching how you react, mm-hmm. and, and so like that. Here's an opportunity to show your character. There's a mm-hmm. boatload of keyboard warriors out there that are like oh man, I can't believe you copied this. And you're like, oh, that's interesting perspective. Like here's the things we did to innovate. And it gives you a chance to showcase your personality and show show everyone watching because the people watching know. They know when people are just being keyboard mm-hmm. junkies. And so it gives you an opportunity to be the bigger person and be like, ah, oh, this here's what we're doing. Here's the cool stuff we're innovating on or something along those lines. Yeah, I, I've gotten better at that too. I'm like not <laughs> just blasting people. And what I've started doing too, and it actually, someone did it. I'll just DM them and be like, hey, here's my cell phone number. Call me. Like I had this kid from Arizona, doesn't run my stuff. And every like ad, every post, he would just go on there and be like, you're copying this. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And finally I was like, Hey man, here's my, call me. We had an hour conversation. Like driving home. Cause like I was just tired of it. Like I was just talking on the phone, like get to know me. Like we'd probably be like good friends if we hunted together. We have a lot in common. Like, I don't know what you're And like, yeah. by the time the conversation was like, Oh, I didn't realize you did that. I didn't realize you changed that. He was just like, I don't know what he, he just had it out for me to just bad mouth me. Yeah. And so I've been doing that. And honestly, people just don't call me, which is awesome. And then they stop commenting. <laughs> so I'm like, Hey man, just, just call me up. Let's talk. It, Cause yeah. like, then you get to know me and you understand like where my mindset is with it. You know what I mean? Like I'm not out there trying to copy people or, or take people or hurt people. I'm just trying to grow a business. I'm a guy with five kids just like you. And I'm just working my butt off trying to grow something. And when you get to have that conversation, people really change their mindset, get to know you. Totally. But I think it's like the next piece of that, which is good. The next piece of that is like, how do you show that at scale? Which is like everyone's watching. And I say that loosely, not everyone sees everything, but to, to, when you see those comments, like all the people watching that are on the fence about you or your product or your brand, mm-hmm. they don't really know. That's an impression. And it may be the only impression you get with them. And so I always look at it as who's watching. And so I type my response that I want to say, and then I delete yep. it. And then do it all the time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All the time. Or I'll, or I'll do is I'll just call one of my friends and talk to him about it or text my friend. Like this is what I want to say. This guy, I'm not going to say it. It's just not worth it. And honestly, with the negative stuff, I feel like it's so motivating for me too. Like it does tear apart. There's someone who did a review the video this year on one of our tripods and it was just so much of it was just so far off of the truth on our tripods, like the design, how it was designed, why it was designed. It was just like, but it was spoken like truth. Like he never called me. Like we just like, what? And I was not happy. Like I was just bummed and I can't not watch it. I have to watch the whole thing, 20 minute review. Like I have to watch the whole thing and they'd eat me alive. But I came out of it and I literally left work that day, drove to sportsman's warehouse and sat by my house, bought a pair of Zulu sixes and created the most bitchin Zulu six mount for Arca. Cause I was so pissed off from this thing. And I made this amount out of it. So I take those, a lot of times I'll take that criticism and use it as motivation and fuel for my fire. Especially, Dude, I think I think it's so underrated. Like the whole negative criticism thing, like it is so underrated. I think we all have that story of someone said I couldn't, so I did it. And you'll go, you'll move mountains to prove people wrong. And I think like mm-hmm. negative criticism is a, I don't want to say it's a good thing, but like it, it's a powerful thing for sure. Like looking back in, in a lot of the things, like so many things that I've built, I, I definitely went way too far and too long on stuff because someone said it couldn't be done, right? Like mm-hmm. that's, that's more motivating to me than be like, oh, you're doing a good job. <laughs> you can tell me I'm doing a good job. It's not going to do anything. But if you say I can't do something, for sure, I'm going to figure out a way to do it. Yeah, my competition should really learn just not to say things about me because <laughs> that's the most motivating thing in the world to me. Like it just yeah. gets me fired up. I'm like, oh, okay, I was tired, but now I'm not. Yeah. Thank you. It's like uh, one of my favorite documentaries is The Last Dance with Jordan. You mm, watch that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And dude, it just talks about how like he be, you know, it just took one thing. A guy didn't shake his hand. He went and scored 70 points the next day. <laughs> or it's just like, one thing would just piss him off. Like they, the, the Pistons beat him, right? And he would, he went home and just they worked. They went straight to the gym and they worked out and got bigger. He put on thirty pounds so they could beat the Pistons the next year. <laughs> like it's just like that. You can look at it two ways. You can look at like negative stuff and like let it eat you alive, or you can look at it as motivation. It's gonna hurt, but right. you gotta learn from it. Like you have to learn from it. And I think the same thing we're talking about going back into hunting. Like you're gonna make mistakes, but you gotta learn from it. Like you, everything you do has an output, right? Like you said, 
So if you're if you blew a stock, put a note in your head for that so you don't do it next time. Don't look at it like, oh my gosh. And trust me, like I've been there. Like when you spend a bunch of time and you miss an animal, we've all done it. Dude, like you want to quit and go home. You want to crawl up on a ball and cry. It's just like, what did I do? How did I spend all that time, four days, finally got in the position and missed the shot? Like that eats you alive, but you got to learn from it and get back up and do it again because you're going to miss again. You're going, it went, without a doubt, you're going to miss again. I tell my kids it all the time because they tend to miss a lot lately. Let's just do it again. Let's go back after it. Dude, I, I got an interesting, I, I didn't, we didn't plan on this, but I, you just made me think of something and you're the only person I think in the world I could talk to this about, but I've had this like concept and it's through watching Supercross in the mental game, the mental side of <laughs> Supercross and t- thinking about hunting. And there's so much to, to be said for like the confidence, right? The mind game and yeah. like, you go into a hunt and you just feel like an absolute killer. There's something super powerful about that. If you go in and I don't care if it's as simple as man, my bow is doing something funny the day before the hunt, all it's all off. And you watch Supercross, you like we're both Supercross nerds and we text each other about this, but when and it comes to Supercross, it is crazy how much the mental game, and you would think that that is the top level performers, but, and I think it's like in an individual athlete sport, and this could be said for a lot of individual athlete sports. It's not a basketball team where you can golf 100% golf. <laughs> yeah. A great example. But like hunting is, is very much this way too. Dude, how much, like how much do you think that the confidence plays in a role? The mind game plays a role in your success as a hunter. Oh, without a doubt it does. And, and I think that's a, another thing we talked about earlier with spending more time in the field and not just going out one time, because you start to learn, oh, that's just part of it. Like I'm probably, there's a reason why this tag is only a 30% success rate. I'm probably going to fail 70% of the time. You have to get that mindset. Yeah, 100%. I think that you're going to go out and you're going to fail. And there's so many times where you just don't want to get out of the tent or like you want to quit because you missed an animal or I've gone home. Like I, I remember gut shooting an animal in Arizona and just going home. I just could not get it back together. It was like day three and I had, I think it was a six day hunt or something or five day hunt. And I was just like, I'm like, I'm over it. I'm going home. I just wounded this animal and it sucks. And I left and I can never get that hunt back. I can't get that tag back. So yeah, it's a huge part of it. And I think even more than I agree. And I've had those experiences. There's one time I left early and that one haunts me for a long time. And actually that negative motivation has kept me on a lot of hunts, but at the same time, there's just something even more nuanced. Like when you feel dangerous and I know like it's so cheesy, but like when you feel like an absolute killer and you're on the mountain mm-hmm. and you're like, man, this like, I, you're more keen. Like your eyes are more keen. You're more, you're looking a little bit extra, right? You're just like, you're going that extra little bit when you have that confidence. And I think that's a bigger, like the mental toughness is its own thing. Getting out of your own head is its own thing. There's macro level decisions that are made along a hunt, but I think like the micro decisions, the little like just extra bit, that extra bit of effort, and it doesn't even have to be like, oh, I'm gonna hike over an extra mountain. It's I'm gonna glass a little bit harder. I just like that confidence. Like I'm gonna find something any second, and that little bit of confidence can go so far on a hunt. And I've just noticed it. And the more I watch Supercross, the more I'm like, man, I think that is a big piece of it. I don't know if you can fake it though. I don't know if you can just be like, man, I feel dangerous today and you're going to be yeah. more, you know, better in the mountain or whatever. Yeah. There's something to be said about when you put your crossroads on an animal and you're like, you're dead. Yeah. You just know sure. you see an animal and you're like, I'm going to kill that animal. Even though it's a thousand yards away, I'm going to do this and this and you're going to kill him. You never go into, if you're going into a stock with the mindset of, oh, I could blow it. Or if I go this way, the wind's like, you're probably not going to kill it. <laughs> you got to go into that thing. Like I'm going to kill you Yeah, with, with confidence. Yeah, I, I think it's a great correlation because look at Joe Shimoda right now. Like dude, when that <laughs> oh, kid starts winning, he's one of the best supercross riders in the world. He can't, he, I think he finished fourth last weekend in Glendale. Like he can't get it together because he's just not winning. But as soon as he starts winning, he'll turn it on. So like by the end of this season, he'll be winning races. Right now, he just cannot get it together. And it's his total mental game. And it, I think the greatest example, that's why I said golf, is Tiger Woods. The guy had, I think it's 13 majors, and like all these wins. And then he got caught cheating on his wife with a bunch of strippers. And the guy can't hasn't won a thing since. I think he's won the one golf tournament since because it's mental. That's crazy. Well, so ball. what is the answer that you think that like for hunting? Is it like small wins? Is it like how because let's just say the average dude goes on a big elk hunt every year, right? And you only get one. So 
it's not like you can go have three bad races and then come back like Eli or something and just be like, uh, oh, I pulled it together. You only get one week out of the whole year to do this like thing. How do you mm-hmm. make sure you're like mentally top performer? I think for me, my mindset has shifted from I have to kill something to I want to enjoy this experience. And that's taking a lot of pressure off. And I go out there with like, I want to enjoy this. I want to spend as much time out here as I can. I can't get, I put my mindset in like, when I'm not here, I'm going to be sitting in my office wishing I was here, right? And I try and enjoy every minute of it. I mean, that kind of sounds like a hippie, but that's my <laughs> thing with it. And like, I try and keep that mindset is like, I'm out here in this world that God created, can do something that everybody wants to do. Let's enjoy this to the fullest, right? I try and keep that positive mindset that way. And plus, I'm just like the glass half full guy when it comes to hunting anyways. Like I know if you ever glass with me, like I'll be glassing 10, 12 hours a day, like all day long. Cause I know that eventually if I glass long enough, something's going to be standing up in that glass. I'm going to find them. So I just stay after it and keep going and don't let my mind wander, I guess. Stay, stay yeah. active. I was trying to think it. I don't know if I'm that, I would say like things have evolved for sure for the last few years and I've gotten really good. I used to want to force things. I think there's, man, it's such a good balance, but it's like, I used to want to just try harder. And I thought if you just tried harder and covered more ground, like Mm -hmm. inputs equal outputs, right? Like you're gonna, you're gonna get the thing. But I realized, and this is a lot from just targeting really big bulls and you have to be much more patient. What people don't realize is that hunting big bulls and hunting like, I would say average elk or whatever are two different games or two different sports entirely. And hunting big bulls sucks. It's super boring. It's not just, Oh, I I, I don't say that lightly. Like it's super boring. It's not like you just go and you get a hunt every single elk, right? It's it's a very different game, but it has taught me a lot. And there's a lot to be pulled from it. Like in the patient side of it, like being way more patient and just like slowing things down. Mm -hmm. I think when I first started to, to give people background, like I grew up hunting Roosevelt's and then I got into the calling game and I was like doing the calling competitions when I was super young. And so calling was always the game, like obsessed about Wayne Carlton. So the run and gun, like way before born, I even know who born and raised was like, we were all doing that. That was just Oregon boy thing. Like we just chased everything. And it was just like, I would just go. And so the harder you pushed it, the more ground you covered, like the more opportunities you got. And we weren't really selective. It was like good bull and kill it. And And that was just mentality. And so when I transitioned, say, to Montana and trying to start hunting bigger bulls and being more selective, it was like, oh, man, you really got to slow down. But the inner me was like, I just wanted to outwork everyone. That was like, Mm -hmm. oh, just keep going, cover ground. And there's so many parallels to business here. But but you learn to be more patient and be more selective with the chances, the opportunities you take. And I think that as you mature as a hunter, you're like, okay, I have to be super patient. I have to have confidence in my plan. And that's the biggest hurdle for me was like having confidence in a plan and sticking to it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's micro adjustments along the way. But if you're like going back to the business thing, if you're always trying something new, you're never going to find success. You have to be persistent. You have to like shout the thing from the top of the mountain for a long time before you figure, before people figure it out. And the same is true for a lot of great hunters. Like they have that ability to go hard, push in, but they also have the ability to be patient when they know the plan is working. And that's, that's the big thing for me is like learning to just be patient, but also trust the process, trust the plan. Like knowing that these inputs are good inputs and we're going to stick to them, keep doing these inputs and not get frustrated. Like I used to, and, Oh, we're going to a different unit. We're going to this area. We're going Mm -hmm. over there and just bouncing around. Yeah. I am nowhere near on the level of you or anyone else when it comes to hunting. But I can say that the patience thing has helped me extremely. If I find a good glassing knob, I love Kuzger. It's my jam, right? And it's like, and I know the area looks like there's gonna be Kuzger in it. I'll sit on that knob for all day sometimes, and I'll just glass 360 on that knob because I know eventually one's gonna be there. Where it used to be like, oh man, let's just go get the truck and move over here, and then let's look over here, and just trying to force the situation versus just letting the situation come to you a little bit too. And, and, and I think that's, that there's a lot of correlations of business there too, with like people will just switch. I have friends who want to own businesses and they just keep failing because they just keep going next, 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 and not just putting their time into one thing. It, you have to pick it and stick to it and be willing just to, to grind it out sometimes. And business is a grind and hunting is a grind. And like I said, a lot of the times you get to be willing to go to Arizona 
after I think you had seven or nine points. Uh, you spent a lot of points in that unit. Yeah, nine points, yeah. You had to be willing to go and burn nine points to kill that big bull, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like, it is what it is. Like you burn them and you don't get them back. But at the same time, like you have to take those risks, right? Like you have to, I could sit here and wait for, I don't even know, unit 10, I don't know what's the top unit, nine or 10. And I could spend my entire life putting in for those and I had the exact same result. And so for me, it's, you have to take risks sometimes. And going back to, I don't know how many business people listen to your podcast, but Sticking to a plan, like what's a good plan? I think there's some validity in saying, I want to test multiple ideas. And this is, I think 20 year olds have the wrong perspective on life <laughs> in a lot of ways, <laughs> but you know, everyone's looking for, oh, how do I become successful? If I was starting over, I would spend, let's just say I would spend my twenties dabbling in new stuff, right? I would try a lot of things and I would get a lot of those at reps, right? At bats. And I tell this pe people about, oh, you need a ton of at, at bats to build that perspective. And, and the same is true for like life in general. Like you should get a lot of at bats references, right? Like you need that context. And then when you see something that works, you have that built up gut intuition. Of, oh, this has potential. And then you stick to the plan, right? You stick to that thing longer than you think. And every friggin' business book in the world will tell you that it's going to take way longer than you think. There's no overnight success. And, and Drew, Drew could tell you like, yeah, you're on a rocket ship, but at the same time, it's probably taking you longer than you think. And actually, I wouldn't say that. Like how many years before the rocket ship took off? It took a long time. Yeah, five years of pushing this thing to finally get it to where it is. And, yeah. and we're still figuring it out and still growing and trying to get, we're nowhere near where we're going to be, right? Like I could right. just, I was talking, like we've had all of our success with literally like four products. And I could probably stop making products now and just be done and just be like, oh, that's going to be a cool income for us in my life or however long the life of the Tricer is. But I don't want to do that. I want to continue to grow and bring more products in and grow that thing. And from there, because I know since day one, since conception, right, I did a video of when I first got the first tripod in Arizona in 2017, I knew what this company could be. And this company is way bigger than it is right now. And I know where I want to go. I don't want to go too much into where I want to go on the podcast, but I know the markets I want to go into within the tripod space and the hunting space that are outside of what we're doing right now. Like I am like, when I tell people like I'm just getting started, like literally I'm just getting started. Like it's just a snowball. It takes time to keep going and going and keep growing it. And I, I think that's super important to understand, like for people listening, like most people will make more in a year of their forties than they did all through their thirties. And so the, the context is it's not linear. So let's just say Drew has this business for 15 years. It's been five. You'll probably make more in your 14th year than the one through 13 or one through 12 in some capacities. Like it just gets bigger and bigger. And I look at the, none of the accomplishments, like look at, okay, if I want to succeed, it's not that I have to make a bunch of money in my twenties. I need to develop the skills and at bats to be mm -hmm. able to see the right things in my thirties. Then in my thirties, I want to focus on those things and learn and get really good at it. Like become the best in the world. Like we'll say Drew's the best at designing tripods in the world. Like that's what he needs to be really great at. And then, you know, the, I would say all the spoils come. And so I think about that too, is like maybe from the hunting perspective is like, yeah, I, man, I've spent 20 years learning and learning. And actually I'm coming into a bunch of really good tags now. And it's, it's cool because it's okay. Now I got the skills. I got the time. I got like, now it's, I'm going to be dangerous. And I, like, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not successful, but I look at it in that perspective of man, it takes so much longer than you think, but it's worth it. For sure, dude. That's good business stuff. Let's go into the hunting side because you keep talking about killing elk. And I think <laughs> everyone knows you're a big elk killer. I would call you a big elk killer. You would be, if you were to put a list out there of like guys who kill big elk, Cody Rich is on that list. I don't know. I don't know about that. When, that's, when, that's did, you kill, when did you kill your first bull? Oh. How old were you? Mm, how old was I? 19? 18 yeah. or 19? You're that old when you killed your first bull. Oh, no, no, I, I, I was 12 technically when I killed my first bull. Sorry, okay. first one with the bow was 19. Okay, you killed your first bull when you're 12. So you, you do come up learning from grandpa and dad and oh, yeah. getting the skills. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, funny enough. My dad was big time elk hunter, loved elk hunting. And he actually 
So we weren't allowed to go elk hunting until we were nine. Like that. So fourth grade was like the first year I could go elk hunting. And so like we, I deer hunted since I was probably three. We go deer hunting around the house, but elk camp, those were traditional rifle elk camps. Like it was five hours away. So you drove to elk camp. So I, I got to go elk camp when I was nine. And actually the very first day everyone went elk hunting, I got to follow dad and we go out and the first morning, like I follow dad and we just get into a herd of elk. Actually, I spotted him and elk bus or whatever. And we, dad shot a spike and he shot the spike. And anyway, I got to pack the, well, I, didn't, I packed the head over to downfall and that was about all as far as I got. But yeah, that was like my first foyer into elk hunting and was like super hooked. And then I think the entire trip after that, I got stuck with grandpa, but like sitting on knobs and stuff. But yeah, my grandpa was a big elk hunter. All of his friends, dad was a big elk hunter. So yeah, in the blood. In the blood. So you kill your first bull. I want to understand the origins of Cody Rich, the guy who has a whole <laughs> elk series, an elk podcast outside of the Rich Outdoors podcast. You you almost didn't even consider the elk you killed with the rifle until you killed your first of your bow. <laughs> Why is that? Right. There's okay, so there's a whole bunch of backstory. So my very first elk, so that I'm at nine. By 12, like I was super into archery, like I did 4 H, all that. All my cousins, so I had a bunch of older cousins. They were big into elk hunting and they started archery elk hunting. And my archery coach, if you will, it was like my dad's buddy. They worked at the mill together and he owned a bow shop. So like we'd literally go to the bow shop and they'd drink beer and I'd shoot bows for hours. And so when I say archery coach, it was a little less professional than that, but, but he was a solid elk killer too. They killed a lot of elk. Anyway. And so when I went on my first elk hunt, I ended up, my uncle's with me and the spike runs by and I shoot the spike and it drops. I would almost say, yeah, I would just say pure luck. This is a r- full run elk. This is your 12 year old elk? Tw- yeah. I was What's 12 right? years old. <laughs> But like my, my uncle and I are sitting like back to back against this tree and this elk comes running by. Like I remember hearing the ground shake. I don't even remember putting the gun up to my eyes. Like I remember shooting and this elk tumbles and my uncle's like, holy crap. And so like we dropped this elk. Long story short, like some guys came in. So we went down and we bumped this elk. He was like right there where I shot him. And they're like, oh crap, we got to wait. And we're like down in this reprod now. And, and we like, start blood trailing a little bit. We bumped the elk again, but he only went 20 yards. I was like, oh, we should wait. And all of a sudden we hear gunshots going off. And so like my uncle just throws me on the ground because it's like right there. And like <laughs> we're yelling and we walk over there. It was like maybe 50 or 60 yards away. And, and like these guys are already skinning the elk. So long story short, I didn't even get to keep my first elk. Someone screwed us out of it. Long story short. So technically my first elk wasn't until 19, but like right after that, I started bow hunting and, um, uh, so I never really rifle hunted again until probably mid twenties. Uh, so I became a, like a diehard archery guy and uh, started archery elk hunting. So it sounds like you grew up in the traditional elk camp, which I always say like traditional elk camp is like, if it has antlers, kill it. Right? Yeah. Like I, I went to Oregon hunted and there was a lot of camps like this where it's like they were just shooting spikes. Right. So how did you transition into now chasing big bulls? Like your first bull at 19, were you like, I'm only going to shoot six by six bulls or how did this, how does this evolve until you've become this guy who kills big bulls, you target big bulls. How did that evolve? What did that look like for you in that process? That's interesting. No one's ever asked me that. So my dad would roll in his grave because my dad actually, he killed 16 bulls and never killed a six by six shot spikes. And I think he had a couple of raghorns. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know where I got the audacity to be like, yeah, I'm a big bull hunter, but like maybe it was just watching too much TV or Primos or Wayne Carlton or whatever. But I like in the early years, I, we used to get this tag in Oregon. It was, it's now very coveted. Just I don't know how I ended up there. So anyway, long story short is I was in a really good unit and I had 30 days to be there. And that was like the first time I got to like call in tons of elk. So I originally hunted Roosevelt's and we'd call in a fair number of bulls. We did pretty good in those years. My cousins were really good hunters and they taught me a lot. And then I went to Sled Springs, we can call it river. So I went to Sled Springs in the early years and I would go there and I had, I remember I was in college and I had basically the whole September off and I was there and I was calling in two or three bulls a day. I know that sounds like a lot, but like we were just in elk and it was like, I was chasing big bulls and I don't know if that's when it all started. It was like, man, I'm, I got all season. Like I'm only going to kill a big bull. And so I started chasing big bulls. I started getting like crazy at bats. Like I was, 
I was hunting every single day, getting into tons of elk, some of the best elk hunting in the world. And, and like just having all these opportunities and actually the first bull I shot, like there was a bull I was after, I, I called him hammer horns and I was on this bull for four or five different days. Like I was in on him. He was a giant. And the day that I ended up killing my first bull with my bow, again, I don't know who, who gave me the audacity to be like, I'm passing. I passed lots of elk that season. Anyway, when you're, ni- when you're 19. Yeah. Oh yeah. Passing elk. That's awesome. And, but I was calling in elk for other people. Like we were killing elk. And so guys were like, I'll be like, Oh, let's go hunting. And I knew some guys up there. And so we'd killed a number of elk that season. Anyway, this, uh, I finally got this bull. He was away from his cows. I called him in and it was one of those deals. It was weird. Cause I saw him coming and he was like at 45. I was like, all he's got to do is go around that tree and it goes through this patch. It was one of those deals where I didn't look at his horns after that. So like I had like the timing was like, basically he goes behind trees and a five point steps out. I never even looked at the horns and I dropped this five point and I'm like, just elated. Like I just killed this bull I've been after for five days and throw the binos. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's not the right bull. I just mm-hmm classic, whatever. And I was still stoked, great opportunity or whatever. But those first few years, I was up there almost every single year and helping other people chase elk. And so I just got a ton of uh, reps, got a ton of at bats, learned so much about calling elk, chasing big bulls. And from there it just escalated. And I wasn't even, I was into big bulls, but my perspective changed. I remember I came to Montana and I hunted with some buddies. I just hung out with these guys about a week ago. And I remember coming to Montana. And to me then, like a 300 was a big bull. And like, I start hanging out with these Montana guys. And they're like, oh, this little 350. And I'm like, are you crazy? And I remember like them talking to them about these bulls being like 360, 370. I was like, that's just unheard of. And when I was 21, like I remember watching the videos and 21, 22, 23, all I wanted in the world was like to be able to hunt 350 bulls. That was such an anomaly to me. I was like, man, that is crazy. And I would catch a glimpse of a 330 or a 340, maybe a 350, like every few years. And it was like this like thing on a pedestal for me that was like, I just want to be able to see one. And like, it became a bit of an obsession. And then when I moved to Montana, like obviously it's just a different caliber of bull around here. And so hunting 350s every year became a real thing. And then it was like, I actually told Kelsey, my wife this year, I was like, I have three tags this year that I'll be hunting 350 bulls. This is 22 year old Cody's dream. Like mm-hmm. just chase them. Even if I don't kill them, like just to be able to be in the woods with that caliber of caliber of bull is, I don't know. That's what I always dreamed about for whatever reason. I don't know why it wasn't like some ego thing. It was just like, Man, to be in the woods with that caliber of bull is just like next level to me. Did you move to Montana for that reason to chase bulls? Mostly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, I remember the year before we moved, there's kind of a lot to it. I always say I want to move to Alaska, but my wife and I met in the middle at Montana. So there's a little bit of that. And like at the time, like I had built most of my businesses, you know this, but like way back in the day, I read four hour work week and I heard, I read that not as like I could live on a beach and do work from anywhere, but as I could live in the mountains and the elk woods and work Mm -hmm. from anywhere. And I like was of the mindset of burn the ships. This is what I want out of life. That's my only goal. And did that fairly successfully and was able to hunt a lot of Septembers from the woods. Sometimes I had to work for a few hours in the morning, but I was always hunting. And and so Montana was the next step. And I remember we were hunting here with a bunch of buddies from Oregon. And they're like, we were talking about how cool Montana was and the hunting or whatever. And they're like, man, why don't you just move here? Like you have an internet company, like you can do whatever you want. And I was like, yeah, why don't I just move here? (laughs) Like the seed was planted. And so then we started looking at it. and, And actually my wife and I were like, it was a big decision. Like my family's So I would be the seventh generation on the family farm, on the black sheep and just left. But for me, it was like, it was a big decision to move away from that home area. No one had ever left in my family, left that area since they they came. And so it was a big decision. And I just looked at it as, okay, let's do it for a year. And let's not say we're moving permanently. We'll just go for a year and try it out. The thing about that is no one ever comes back once they do that. But it's a good, it's a good way to put a temporary boundary on it. So it doesn't feel like a forever commitment. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And so now you, have you killed a 350 bull? No, still haven't. <laughs> still haven't got one. You're chasing him. Still chasing it, man. Which is crazy. I have been around a lot, man. I, yeah, it's been a rough couple of years. I feel like I've missed bulls. I've had situations like just, I feel like it, I got a monkey on my back now. <laughs> 
So you do though, you consistently are one of those guys who just kill six by six bulls though. You consistently yeah. are killing those good bulls. Now bulls that I would just think are like, I would be ecstatic for. Right. But it's just neat to see like people's perspective on things, right? What, like I would just be like, some of the bulls you killed is like to the moon. So mm -hmm. stoked. And you're like, next, I want to go to the next level. And it's even business too, right? Like you could be so jacked about your, hundred thousand dollar company or you can be jacked about your hundred million dollar company. It's just like, there's different levels to this, I won't say sport, but to this life, right? To business, yeah. to hunting, and you can evolve into it. And it's neat to see that your level is now I want to kill a three fifty bull. I remember you telling me when you're in Arizona, I'm not killing a bull that's less than three fifty. And you drove all the way down here and you had opportunities at bulls, correct? In Arizona? Yeah. Yeah. That you could have killed and you didn't kill him. Because you wanted the one you showed me was like 370 or something right it was big yeah and there's levels of the game like people get upset when i say a small 315 bull and you have to figure out, i've been doing this for 20 some years and it's interesting i don't want to say it's like keeping up with the joneses but out of my friends i'm like the worst elk hunter i feel like like my buddy's all killing 370 380 bulls and i'm like man i suck at this <laughs> so it's all relative right and i think that's good i think you have to not let more consume you. And it's the same and true. The same is true in business and in life and everything. I think there was a time where I was like, man, I suck at this. Like all my friends are killing 370, 380 bulls. And I'm just like, man, I can't even kill a 350. And, that, and that's tough. But at the same time, you just have to be happy where you are. And it's going back to, man, I'm so thankful to be out here. And so I look at it as, man, I'm thankful to be hunting 350 bulls. If I get the monkey off my back, I do. Great. And for me, I know what's going to happen. I'm not worried about that. Like I'm around them all the time. I'm chasing big bulls. It just hasn't, the stars haven't aligned yet. And, but at the same time, I don't know, like this year I killed some gray bulls. But I still, part of me still feels like I killed him for the internet. Like it, to me, it's, I don't know, the, the bull I killed in Idaho or in, in Montana, they were great bulls and most people would be super stoked with them and they're 320 bulls. But at the end of the day, it's, I don't know, I feel like I sold myself short. Like I set a goal and I didn't accomplish it. And I, I don't know, there's reasons to do it. And nowadays being the public eye, like now I have a part of me, like this feeling guilty about like, having an elk course and it's, you can't strike out and not kill anything. But at the same time, I freaking hate killing 300 inch bulls for the internet. Like just so I can post them on the internet. And it's man, I love to me, I would rather go 30 days and hunt elk every single day than kill a medium bull on the first day of season. Like I just, I, I love the experience. I love the challenge. Like, I love getting better. So to me, like getting better is spending 30 days out there with them learning, even if that is a failure. I think there's something to be said though for confidence going back to the motocross game. I knew this year, I would say last year it was 350 or bust and I held true to that. And then this year it was like, man, I, I need to get a W. I feel like I'm, <laughs> I need to get that confidence back. And so like now I'm like going into next season, like 350 or bust again. And so dude, it ebbs, ebbs and flows. You had a, you had a Cooper Webbit this year. You just had a win. Webbit. You had a win without winning. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. How much of that 350 bull is luck? Because you said like the stars haven't aligned. Like what percentage, there's skill, right? There's time in the field. What percentage of it, like is it the last 10%? What what percentage of it is, is the luck with hunting? That's a great question. And I think it depends on every hunt. If I lived in Oregon, if I was hunting 350 bulls in Oregon, like I would say it's mostly luck. There's so much luck involved. It just depends on the area. But there's places in you know other states, like you go to Arizona and I would say it's, it's not 100% luck by any means. Some skill and you know maybe it's 10 or 20% luck. So I think there's always a luck component. I think that's with everything though. Man, timing and luck is, mm -hmm. is so important. And people like to say, oh, was it hard work and time? Something about hard, the, the harder I work, the luckier I get. I think that's true to an extent but I don't think it covers everything. I, I read tons and tons of business books. And I think you could boil most of the success stories you read in Forbes or business books down to like timing and luck was a huge piece of it. Like Yeti was really interesting. And man, that was a great idea or whatever. But like timing and luck had a big piece of that. Like you can't say it was like all thought out and like perfect. You couldn't repeat it. No, you couldn't. And it's what's crazy with Yeti. And this is... Like they sell chairs for four hundred dollars. <laughs> you're like, dude, they sell coolers for eight hundred bucks, and we gladly pay because it, it says Yeti on it. I just don't. It's awesome. It's right. almost like that Liquid Death. Like we talked about Liquid Death today. Like yeah. the guys like started as a joke. Like he was. He's from motocross. You understand? You, you know the backstory of that? I didn't know that. No. So he was. So when you 
he thought energy drinks were such a scam, right? So if you, when you look at the podium, Hayden Deegan drinking a monster, it's actually water. Yeah. It's yeah. water. So that's where this whole thing came from is like, why not just can water? I can and just brand it. Yeah. And that's how the whole thing started as a joke. And it just like, it just took off like wildfire. They have 2 million followers on Instagram, right? And they're just selling stuff. It's like a hundred million dollar company now. It's a great a thing on, not Spike. What is that thing? I think they just went out of business on YouTube. They have a, whatever. I'll send it to you. There's a great story on it on YouTube, like their whole origin story where they came from. But it was a lot. It was just luck. Sometimes it just happens, man. But a lot of luck is created too, right? Like you got to peer off in the right place and be willing to fail, right? right? So if you're not out there chasing bulls, like he's not going to behind that tree. If you go totally. home, if you go back to the tent, like you have to be there to create that luck. But there is an aspect to it. You do hear about the dude on his side by side in Colorado every couple of years. He just shoots a 230 inch buck. He was going out elk hunting and he, a deer stood up and he shot it. So sometimes you get lucky. Yeah. And I don't think it's to me like killing one 350 isn't, that's just, maybe that's all luck. Maybe it's not, I don't know. But like killing a 350 bull every single year, I have buddies that can produce 350 bulls almost every single year. And you're like, that's definitely not luck. Yeah, that's insane. That's nuts. But if you can produce a, I got a buddy who's averaging probably, I have to do the math again. I know he's averaging over a 375. That's like, crazy. All time. So <laughs> age nuts. class on that bull is seven years old? Probably older. And I just read an interesting study actually that Jaden sent it to me. And it was talking about how basically bulls and bucks will hit 90% of their peak by, gosh, what was it? I think it was like year six or seven for bulls mm -hmm. and three or four. And so people think it's like this linear number or this linear it's age not. growth thing. It's not. It's like pretty young. It, it might have been two years old for a deer. It was something crazy. I remember looking at me like, that's wild. But they hit 90% of their growth potential and then that can flux based on environmentals. And then sometimes they have a spike one way or the other in old age, but it's not what we think of like this. The, he's a two point this year and then a three point and then a four point and then a, like yeah. They start to aggress. Yeah. So right. that ranch I hunted in Sonora, they only shoot mature deer. And mature deer to them is like four and a half and older, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like the buck I killed eight and a half years old, but he regressed like 10 inches in the That's last wild. year. He was like a 118, four point on one side. Just the buck I shot still freaking wicked. It's like 108 inch buck, 31 inches of mass, just everything I wanted in a coos deer. But he regressed and that's their thing is like, there's just like this perfect point where he just blows up and it's like, they say it's four and a half to five and a half, six and a half is like when they really just get giant right then. And you can see it in them too, but you know what they're going to be at two and a half, right? At right. three and a half, you can kind of right. see what they're going to be. You can see them because they're a little stringy and they, but the antlers are there and like, oh, this buck will be this in a couple of years. But yeah, there is a peak to it. So like you bulk and just, they start going down. They can't. Which is wild. And then like with bulls, it's interesting because you can have a good water year and it can flux 10 or 15 inches, oh, no yeah. problem. Oh, yeah. And then it, it's interesting because like this year in Arizona, everyone's, oh, what a year to have it. What a year to have it. The weather, the water, all this. But then the vegetation must have been way different because everyone's, man, they're not seeing anything. They're not where they used to be. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it's the catch 22 of, oh yeah, great bull or antler growth year. Can't find them. <laughs> There's just too much, too much feet everywhere. Too much water, too much stuff. Yeah, yeah but that's hunters though. Dude. We bitch about everything. It's all, oh, I, I killed them because of the full moon. Oh, I didn't kill them because of the full moon. It's, I still don't know. I don't like a full moon. And I'm like, these guys I was snoring with, oh, the full moon's the best. That's the best time to hunt. And I'm like, what? Like, it's people, everyone's different. Everyone has an excuse. Like, it was too hot. There was too much water. There wasn't enough water. It's just, <laughs> we immediately want to make excuses for why we spent all this money and had to go home and tell our wives we didn't kill anything. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I, I see that too. Is they're bugling or they're not bugling? It's yeah, somewhere on the mountain they're bugling. <laughs> yeah, they're there somewhere. We're getting to the end of the thing. We're over an hour. I like to wrap up with like a hunting story. Just give me a good hunting story, campfire. Give me a bitch hunting story, and then we'll send this thing off. What kind of hunting story you want, man? What's the lesson we want to? Whatever you want to give me. Give me your favorite told. hunting story. Give me the one you like to tell. The good story. Man, I'm trying to think of a good one. You should have warned me. Could tell. I already told half of them my first elk story. Oh, okay. I got one. Oh, this is actually good. So this year I drew an Idaho rifle tag and it was special to me because it was the unit that I first hunted out of state. It was my first out of state hunt and my first six point. So fast or flashback, what year is that? I know there was like a 15 year gap. So 2008, I started hunting out of state and I went to Idaho and I went to this unit. I didn't know anything about the unit, drove through it once. And this is like 
even pre me e scouting. I think I like I, I remember ordering the maps and like getting the maps or whatever, but pretty fresh. And I went there and I hunted super hard. I chased some great goals. Long story short. I get on this bull and it is a absolute storm. It's raining sideways and I'm, I'm chasing this bull and <laughs> I just can't catch up. He's a herd bull. He's got a herd and I'm like always running into the spikes and I'm trying to keep up and it's just absolutely downpour. And this bull steps out and I go to use my range finder and I got nothing. It's just, it's not even yep. turning on. And I was like, no. And I was like, thinking about taking the shot, but I'm like, I just don't know. I didn't know how far it was. And I let him walk out of my life and I, I like they shut up and we're gone. And I was so heartbroken. One of those times I almost quit. I literally drove back to camp and my tent has got like four inches of water in it. And <laughs> my air mattress, like the air mattress thing is like floating. All my gear is soaked. I'm just like, oh my gosh, like it's over. This is it. I'm done. And I remember thinking like, I'm going to go just I'm going to go to town, get some new rain gear, get a new range finder. Cause I, my rain gear was garbage. So I went to buy Mart and I got a new rain gear and I got a new range finder and had a burger and the sun had came out and I was like, all right, like I got to give it one more shot. So I go back and everything's you know, hanging up in the trees. I'm going to go for an evening hunt. And that evening I go on a hunt, I go back in there and I'm listening, nothing. And I'm like walking down the road and I didn't like where I left these elk was quite a ways away. So I wasn't expecting it, but all of a sudden like I hear a bull just absolutely rip like right next to me. And I'm like, holy crap, like literally standing on the road and here's where luck, you know, strikes you. And I look up and here comes a cow over the hill and she like run is like coming down at me. So I'm like knocking an arrow and this bull just comes over the hill screaming right behind her. And he like turns and he screams, I range him and I shoot and uh, smoke him. And he like runs over the hill and I'm like, Holy crap. That just, that just happened. And like all that work, I almost left. I was so close to you to like just driving home and I didn't. And I shot that bull long story. I go back in there and I pack this bull out and it was, you know, it rained all night. It was absolutely miserable. And I have this picture, this old picture of me like in the brush with this like big six by six bull. And that was my first six by six. So fast forward this year and I drew the tag again and I was pretty stoked to go back to the same area like 15 years later and I had the rifle tag and the rifle tag's hard to draw. And the units definitely gone downhill, but I was like, still had a high hopes. So I go back in there and this time I e-scout it and I had to actually figure out where I was because I hunted this unit a number of years and I had some pins or whatever. And it, long story short, I e-scout the crap out of it and I go back in there and this year it was fun. It was really cool. There was a lot of people, like it was a, definitely a rifle tag and I didn't factor in all the deer hunters because I showed up a little bit earlier than I should have. So there's all these deer hunters and there's all these cow hunters and all this stuff. But long story short, I go in there and I had a good hunt and hunted hard. I had an opportunity at like 330 bull and I screwed it up just last minute, like just middle of the day, I walk into this bull and he's bedded there. Anyway, ended up shooting a good bull and in the snow, it was super cool. It meant a lot to me. It was funny because like when I did kill this bull, it was that day I like the, the mountain was empty. There was no one. And like for the last week, it'd been just packed. And so like it snows. The day before I shot this bull, I didn't see an elk. I covered 13 miles, didn't see a single elk. And I, and I was like starting to second guess myself. So when this bull steps out, I ended up shooting him or whatever. And I was stoked about it. It was a cool hunt. It was super cool to relive that. Mm -hmm. Oh man, this is like the, where it all started, like way back in the day before I knew anything. And I was hunting right over there and it wasn't that far from where I killed the two bulls, but 15 years apart. So that was super cool. And I was by myself, but I met some really cool dudes, old timers on that hunt. And there's this one old timer. He'd always swing by my camp and at BS and going back to having old school, traditional elk camp, like with my dad and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Most of the time I'm hunting by myself these days. And so I, I didn't have that, but I had this old timer. He would always swing by my camp and man, just one day he swung by and I think we BS for three hours. And so it was cool. Like hear old stories and the guy had been there for a hundred years, all these stories. So it was super cool. It was fun. That's awesome, dude. That's a, uh, that's what I want to hear is a great elk story. It's awesome. <laughs> I appreciate it. So man, where can we find you? Where do you want to plug yourself? You want to plug Rich Outdoors? What do you got going on? Yeah. Yeah. Still. I'm, I'm building something. Drew knows all about it, but it's it's going to come soon. So I'll tease that. Like it's coming soon. I wasn't. Uh, gonna, I didn't even know if I was going to say. That. I was going to say that you're building something <laughs> awesome because I am so excited for what Cody's building, and it's probably been like almost a year now. I've been talking to him about it, and I'm I just know. like, 
Yeah, I'm excited. Because I remember like the first time he texted me about it and we started talking, we talked for an hour. I was just like, oh, what if you did this? What if you did this? What if you did this? Yeah. Like, I get, I'm happy for you. I'm happy for people who are <laughs> successful and do things. And I'm like, I'm so happy to see what this turns into for you because I hope you're like Steve Jobs, dude. I'm excited. <laughs> That's funny. Maybe this is a conversation for off the podcast, but like I, I've been holding it in so long. I don't know when to start saying it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm not like trying to keep a secret at this point. It's dead, like for at first it was like this big unknown. And so I'm trying to like, okay, I, I set a date in my head that we're going to start teasing it. So I'll start teasing you today. I say something's coming. I won't say what, but like something cool is coming. We've been working on it for a long time, but yeah, other than that, I check out everything I'm doing with, so the elk hunt channel. So we've separated and I have the rich outdoors podcast, which is my per, become my personal podcast. I talk a lot about entrepreneurship, life, lifestyle design, all the things that I'm interested in outside of hunting and in hunting. So it's a, it's a very diverse podcast. And then a lot of my elk stuff now is just through the elk hunt podcast. And I have, I brought on a partner with that just cause I'm so busy doing the other thing. So Zach Bohays helping me out with that. And so we're, we're really trying to grow that thing. And Zach wants to take that full time. So I have someone that to pick up my slack when I'm screwing off so much, but so yeah, t- check out the rich outdoors or, and, or the elk hunt podcast. That's awesome, dude. Let's let's do it again. Kill it for sure, people and come tell me a story about it. Yeah, eventually. It'll be weird when it happens. <laughs> yeah, you get to go 400. Yeah. Thanks, bro.